The four Sundays leading up to uh, Christmas are known in the church calendar as the season of Advent, meaning the coming or the arrival. And when we speak of Advent, we're talking about and we're looking at three comings of Jesus. The first one being the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. The second is the coming of Jesus into our lives, the birth of Christ within us. And the third is we look for the coming of Christ that will happen at the end of history. And my brothers and sisters, when we worship today, we are caught up in all three of these comings. Are you with me? We celebrate the coming of Jesus in Bethlehem, the coming of Christ in history. We find joy in the coming of Christ among us and in us. And we longingly look for the coming of Jesus as he will come to put the world to rights at the end. Are we with me? And so for our call to worship, we want to situate ourselves in the first coming of Christ in Bethlehem. And that is what we are going to read together. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. Let us continue singing to this Jesus. Okay. 
Church, you know, the Bible says that in a season of preparation and expectation and business, Mary found favor of the Lord. We're in that season too. Season of preparation and busyness and running around and trying not to slip and slide. Yet in this season, we can find favor of the Lord. And um, we gather together as a church, as a congregation, not to score some brownie points from the Lord, but so that we can send our hearts back in the Lord in this season. To say, Lord, I long for you and your presence. I wanna find favor in your eyes. I wanna find rest in you. Father, we honor you. Father, and in this season, of busyness and preparation. We want to be found like Mary was found. We want to find favor in your eyes. Lord, may we be found at rest in you, at peace with you, at peace with fellow men. Holy Spirit, I pray today, draw our hearts back to you and to your presence. Center our hearts and our attention and our minds back on you. Holy Spirit, may this season be a season of joy. May this season be a season of memories. May this be a season of reconcilement and restoration and rest. We pray this today in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Worship team, you all are amazing. You guys are so good. I was just standing on the side today. I was like, man, they're good. Josh, you're amazing, bro. <laughs> Love you guys. You may be seated. Thank you for being with us today at Woodmark Church. So good to see all of your faces. Uh, what an exciting season it is for us. As Paul mentioned, uh, we are in a season of Advent and um, uh, and so today we kick off a new sermon series called The King is Born. Uh, it's going to be a great series that we're working on with several of our team members. And uh, we're excited for uh, these next four weeks and uh, what we're going to learn together as a congregation. If you're new with us today, welcome. Thanks for being with us. My name is Russell. I'm one of the pastors here. And um, if you are new with us, I'd love to invite you today after service to stand, stay around for an hour. Uh, that hour will help melt even more of the snow. Uh, and uh, we just want to uh, share a little bit more about who we are. And so we do this once every other month. And we provide lunch and we provide child care. If you haven't gone through Discover, but you've been att attending here at Woodmark, we would love for you to be with us today right after service, even if you didn't sign up. So... Uh, it'll be happening in just one of the classrooms uh, right after service. You are welcome to join us. If you're not able to join us this time, we'll do it again in, uh, in the new year. We'd love for you to be a part of that. A couple announcements for us in our church and uh, this calendar that's before us. We try to be minimalistic during this time in terms of not overloading things in the schedule for you and your families. Uh, and But with that in mind, just wanted to mention a couple things that we're doing as a congregation that uh, I think you will find a blessing to be a part of and create some great memories. Uh, first, next Sunday evening, we are holding a Woodmark Gala, a Woodmark Church Gala, where uh, we are looking back at this past year. This is our first year together. We started Sunday morning services in January of this year. And so at this event, we're just going to look back at the past and uh, just remember what the Lord has done. And we're going to recognize some volunteers and we're going to celebrate and play some games. And so we'd love for you to join us. If uh, you're serving here in any capacity, we expect you and hope you're here. Uh, but if you're just in a season of sort of considering Woodmark to be your church, uh, this is a great way to kind of see what our team is all about. Uh, and so one of the best places to come besides this is this Woodmark Gala because you get to see our team together in action. Uh, but we do want you to let us know if you do plan to come and you can do so on our website or, on, or within our app. It takes literally one second to do. So if you can just do that today, we would appreciate it. 
as you plan for Christmas Eve, um, we always want to come together as a congregation on Christmas Eve and celebrate and sing carols and, uh, and, and, and just celebrate the coming of Jesus. And so this year on Christmas Eve, we're doing two services, one at 6 p.m. and one at 8 p.m. So if you open up Christmas, you can come to the 6 p.m. service, be done around 7, and then go and open presents on Christmas Eve. But you could just even stay, uh, serve one service, attend the other, and open Christmas presents on Christmas Day and Sunday morning. Uh, but you are welcome to join us for Christmas Eve services here at 6 p.m. and 8 p.m. And then a couple events uh, connected to our younger uh, generations, our kids and our youth. We are doing a big Christmas event for our kids uh, on Sunday morning, December 18th. So it'll be a regular part of what we do on a Sunday morning. But our kids choir is going to participate in our worship. And then right after that, they will have a big kids Christmas party with decorating cookies and all of the kids are going to get a Christmas present that Sunday morning. Uh, so if you've got a kid in your neighborhood that you want to bring to church, that's a great Sunday to invite them, December 18th. And then our youth, uh, they're doing several things during this Christmas. Uh, one is there's a youth par Christmas party coming up here on the, uh, on the 13th. Uh, where they're going to have a bunch of different games and, um, and uh, gingerbread house comp building competition. And, and so the youth party is happening for middle school and high school stu students on the 13th. And then the Tuesday afterwards, I think they're going out to like Snowflake Lane and ice skating. One of the things that I've always done growing up is in youth, we'd go caroling. I'm hoping our youth are planning some caroling opportunities this Christmas. You guys, I'll send you my address. Stop by our home. Welcome. <laughs> Love for you to stop by our house and carol as well. Um, we were preparation for Night to Shine. And when I mention that, I know some of you, most of you are thinking Christmas and December and closing out 2022. You're not thinking 2023 yet. This is an event that's happening in February, but preparations are happening now. This is an event that we're doing for, for the community with special needs. And we'd love for you to let us know if you can be a part of that event as a volunteer. We're, we just need 250 volunteers, and so you'll hear about this every week until we have 250 volunteers. Right now, I think we're like 22 volunteers. All right, we have more people with special needs sign up to be a part of this event that's, than volunteers. So you'll hear about this often. But if you could, uh, take time. Just let us know that you are planning to serve at Night to Shine. It helps us as we plan right now all the different teams and what we're able to do. Uh, with that, uh, I just want to finish up to say, say thank you for your giving and generosity. Uh, we're able to do some unique things as a church. Uh, in our first year as a church, uh, to do what we did this year is nothing short of a miracle. Uh, in terms of the projects that we've been able to be a part of, I don't know if any of you have been following Max, who's right now in Ukraine. Uh, he is, I think he was in the city of Kharkiv, which just maybe a couple weeks ago was all over the news as it was being bombed out completely. And uh, I think it's like negative 30 degrees right now on the streets and he's out there with the keyboard singing. Uh, and uh, you are a part of that and what he's doing there as well as a congregation. Uh, we've, we've, uh, we're a part of uh, the outreaches that they're doing. I know they took a bunch of generators uh, to some of those churches and ministries. And, and a lot of those areas are completely without lights and power. And, uh, and, and so you are a part of that and you're giving. And so many other ways that, that you're giving serves this community. And so just want to say thank you for your giving and your generosity. Well, before we transition to reading of the word and today's message, uh, we are going to have a time of baby dedication. This is one of my favorite things to do as a minister, as a pastor, uh, because it, it is uh, a, such a vital moment in the life of this baby and in the life of this family. So I want to invite uh, those families who've brought a little one to be dedicated today uh, forward to the stage. I know we've got some, uh, we've got Veronica and baby Josiah and uh, baby Johannes and uh, and. and Many, we got, I think, six or maybe seven kids uh, that are planning to be dedicated today. So families come forward. 
you move just a little bit more we got one more family coming so uh, I'm gonna go around and you guys just tell us a little bit about your baby and who you're dedicating today to the Lord good morning church so we're dedicating our baby uh, Johannes well not so much a baby anymore he runs around the house uh, very active not like his older brother and sister so he's our third one so we're happy to dedicate him today. Uh, awesome. Our third one is the most active one too. I'm the third one in the family. My wife's the third one in the family. Johanna, special blessing coming to you. <laughs> All right. Who are you dedicating today? Uh, hi, church. We're dedicating our son, second son, David. And he's very active too. <laughs> he's not third, he's only second. So uh, we want him to be blessed by Lord. Uh, good morning, church. I'm um, dedica uh, dedicating today daughter, Veronica, and she is also very, very active in comparison to my son. Awesome. This is Arrow Gunning, and this is um, our nephew and the grandparents. The mom is not here, but we are dedicating him today. So cute. This is uh, baby Josiah. Um, he's active, sure, especially when it's time to sleep. Um, and uh, yeah, he's our second boy that we want to dedicate. Um, we will be dedicating Eleanor. She's a little fussy, but <laughs> she's our first. <laughs> well, I just want to take a minute to say um, a couple things. We've got four kids, and you know, I was thinking about this. It's like, well, our kids aren't grown up yet, so sometimes some will say, well, you got to wait until your kids are grown to be able to say anything about parenting. And, and here's the problem, is that sometimes then I'm forced to be quiet and not say anything until they grow up. And then once they do grow up, the other side happens like, oh, you're too old to speak about parenting because, you know, your par the parents are living in a different generation. You can't really speak into parenting today anymore. It's like, so when do I get to speak into parenting? Um, I, I want to share, when it comes to parenting, two important things. One is time. When it comes to parenting... Time is so vital. Quantity of time and quality of time. You can't give that up. As parents and grandparents and family members, um, there, there are opportunities to be involved in business and ministry and hobbies and all kinds of things. But one of the most important things that you will ever give your time to is time with your family and time to your children. It is so vital. Business opportunities will come and go. There will always be a need for more ministry and more ministry workers. Your time with your children is so vital. Listen, this season will not last forever. And when you have this season, this is the time to invest into your children. Time will come. You won't have this opportunity anymore. Uh, you all in heaven, we get to sing for a long time. We won't have an opportunity to give in heaven anymore. It's like, we're not going to go to the streets of gold and take some of the gold out. It's like, okay, Lord, here's some more gold. It's like, everything is amazing, right? In heaven, we won't have an opportunity to give. Well, when your children are grown, you won't have that opportunity anymore to spend time with them. And so the, what I want to encourage you, even as a pastor, listen, it's okay if sometimes you miss some opportunities, but if you're investing your time in your children, that's one of the best investments you will make. Give time to your kids. The second thing I will say to you is this. One of the most important things that our children need today is a non-anxious presence. A non-anxious presence. Now, part of it is I'm reading a book about being an, a non-anxious presence, and so it's in the top of my mind. But do you know that research indicates that your children's I'm sorry, I want to be honest here. When parents have an argument, you can tell by their children's urine. Their urine even changes. This comes from a study at University of Washington. 
that a child's urine even changes when the parents are in a disagreement. When the parents are arguing, when there's, you know, this unsettledness going on in the home, when there's always this stress at a peak level and, and, and infighting and worries, like your children, it affects them and who they are. One of the best things that you can give to your children and your grandchildren is a non-anxious presence. We want to pray for your children today. I want to invite all our congregation. Let's stand to our feet. I want to invite several of our ministers up forward here uh, to come forward. Uh, Brother Alexander, Vlad, uh, uh, Rocky, uh, come on forward. Brandon, why don't you come over here, brother? Uh, Alex will have you come up as well. All right. Now, uh, Daniel and... Um, I know that you guys, Daniel, Tanya, your little one started crying. Next week, we're going to have another baby dedication for a little child that's going through chemotherapy today uh, in the hospital. Couldn't be with us. It's a two-year-old that's blind and going through chemotherapy. So we'll have a baby dedication next Sunday again. And Daniel, Tanya, we'll get to your child next week as well. Or we can do it at the end of service. But we want to invite you, um, some of our ministers, we can hold your child if your child is willing. Or just place your hand on the child. Church, can I have you just stretch your hands towards these families? I want to pray for these families. Father, we thank you. We thank you for these blessing these families and giving life to these little ones. Holy Spirit, today in this precious moment, we dedicate these children to you. Father, may their names be written in the Lamb's book of life. Father, may they grow up to know you and honor you and serve you. May they grow up to be the head and not the tail. May they grow up to be people of influence and people of leadership. Holy Spirit, may they grow up to love you and love your church. Father, may they grow up to love the community and serve others. Lord, I pray that they may be people of integrity and people of your word. Holy Spirit, today, as we dedicate these children, we also dedicate these parents and grandparents and, and, and aunts and uncles and the whole families combined. Holy Spirit, I pray your supernatural wisdom, Father, protection, Lord, over their lives, over their homes. Protect them, Father, from the influence of all kinds of philosophies around us, Lord. Protect their minds. Protect their hearts. Protect their physical bodies. Protect their bodies from cancer and disease and sickness. Holy Spirit, protect their bodies from all kinds of viruses. But also protect their minds, Lord, from, from everything that is around us, Lord, and that can lead them away from your truth and your word. Father, may, they, may these children be be under your protection. Holy Spirit, your guardian angels, may, be the, may they be upon their homes. Father, bless these families financially. Father, bless them with provision in every area of their lives. Holy Spirit, I pray that your joy and your peace will dwell, dwell in these homes. Father, where these children grow up, Father, may your presence be ever present to them. We bless them today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we've got a little present for you guys from the church. Uh, may the Lord bless you and bless your families. You guys may be seated. Well, in a minute, you're going to get to hear from uh, one of our pastors, Pastor Alex. I uh, just wanted to uh, mention some of you have not, maybe not, have, heard, have not heard him speak. Uh, Alex is, um, uh, is not just a, one of our pastors here, but he's a future church planner. And he's actually in the stage of uh, preparing a team to plant a church uh, potentially about an hour north of here. And uh, we've just been so blessed by Alex and the blessing that he's been to our congregation. Uh, but we as a church are going to be part of his story for years to come. 
And um, so we're excited about that. And, and uh, we're, you, you're going to be blessed hearing from him today. But before we do that, I want to invite you to stand to our feet for the reading of our scripture. I want to invite Shania forward. Church family, we're going to read from Genesis 49, 10. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he to whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of the nations shall be his. Continuing to Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Thus, there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to Messiah. Thank you, sir. Good morning, Woodmark Church. I was walking through the door, through the door up there, and uh, during the church service, when you walk out, there's like these little bells they keep ringing. Um, and I thought, you know, did, did you know that Jingle Bells, the song, um, doesn't have any words in it about Christmas whatsoever? There's, I mean, there's no Jesus, there's no Santa, there's no gifts, there's no Christmas trees. Uh, in fact, it's not even a Christmas song. It was written in 1850 with the title, uh, One Horse Open Sleigh, and it was meant for the American holiday of Thanksgiving, of all holidays, right? When I look at it, I think if we don't look back to the origin of things, we might find ourselves thinking in a certain way just because it has always been so. And so today we'll be looking back at something not so trivial. In fact, it would probably be of utmost importance. Um, we'll, be, we'll be looking at the origin, I guess, of Christmas, right? Like what led up to the birth of Jesus Christ? But first, here we are in December, right? I mean, isn't it crazy? This is the second uh, Christmas that Woodmark Church gets to celebrate together. Time flies by really fast. And so I thought as December rolls in, uh, with it come the usual December things. We've got caramel brulee latte, peppermint mochas, hot cocoa. Um, what else? You see uh, apple cider. You see the lights start to come up in your neighborhood. Uh, you got Christmas trees. There you go. Candy canes, I, I don't even need to go through my list. Like all these things, you know, the reruns of winter themed movies, uh, Santa Claus, maybe a little bit of snow. Um, everybody's decorating, retailers are decorating. You get the ads of a perfect gift for your loved one for Christmas. And it's all in anticipation of the eve and the day of Christmas. And strangely enough, it gives almost a complete picture of how people see Christmas. I mean, think about it. Without a single mention of Jesus, we can really feel the spirit of the holidays. And that's where we can find ourselves being sucked into a secular Christmas and have it slowly dull our appreciation for what really happened 2,000 years ago. The joy and the beauty of what actually happened there in the manger. In a few weeks, we're about to celebrate 152nd Christmas as a country, as a federal holiday. And looking back 
even through the pictures, through the paintings, through the stories, we can see how vast is the gap between how we used to celebrate it to how we celebrate it today. Today, at best, the Christmas is just a celebration of a Christian wise teacher who was born, uh, surrounded by animals, who taught good morals so that we can have a good life, right? At worst, it's just a season of cheer, winter-themed celebration, just a holiday derived completely from its etymology. I mean, if it's a holiday, holy day. And every time we celebrate an event, something that we commemorated, right? Something that we remember. There's two things happen. We look back to see what we're celebrating. So we're remembering it. But also every time we celebrate it, a new layer is added on top of it, the way we celebrate it. And it tends to rewrite sometimes the meaning so that by the time you're years down the road, you're celebrating oftentimes something to altogether different. And I think it's fascinating what the lights and sounds and smells can do with our perception. It can really bring about a cheer without any reason, really. For so many around us, they will celebrate Christmas as just another day off. Another relic of the past with some warm traditions that are plucked out and hollowed out of their meaning and substance. And oftentimes, it gets morphed into something less religious and more inclusive, so everybody can celebrate. 19th century ushered in a reconstruction of the way we celebrate Christmas and the holidays. The major effect, of course, came from literature. As more started to write of how they celebrated Christmas, it, it tends to, to restructure the way we think about holidays. And I think media today plays that same role in, in our lives. And then, of course, came the Industrial Revolution, and it transformed the way that goods were produced. Uh, if before, uh, you know, it was handmade and produced by local craftsmen, um, now the factories and, and, and uh, the mass production began, so now things were more quicker, more available, in much more uh, quantities, higher volumes. And so in, 19, in 1855, Macy's is the first department store that opens up, and this is like the time in the late 19th, 19th century when shops began advertising to the people to shop for the holidays. And you could say this was the beginning of commercialization of Christmas. Now, in 1903, a new shift came. I mean, this is just, what, 120-something years ago, right? A new shift came where so many people were lined up at the store that they're like, we need to do something about this. So a new campaign came out, which was titled Shop Early for Christmas. And that's a trend that started 100 years ago, and it's, you know, going on till today. In fact, in America, uh, people begin shopping for Christmas in October, apparently. Now, in 1950s came the TV advertisement. And again, that's a new layer of redefining what Christmas is. Every time you see an ad, every time you see a movie, read a book, it redefines what Christmas is for the society. By mid-2000s, over 1 billion consumers were shopping online. And so we find ourselves here with all the cheer and lights and fancy decor, the celebration where the celebration is largely swallowed by consumerism. And on the one hand, uh, everyone is celebrating Christmas, so that's great, right? But they're really celebrating something entirely different at this point. Something that doesn't represent what it was meant to be. We call it the most profitable season of all, or at least the consumer industry calls it. And you might be aware uh, that the National Retail Federation forecasted the growth of 6 to 8% for this year for the spending uh, you know, on holiday things. Uh, that would come out to roughly $950 billion will be spent this year just on gifts and holiday-themed things. We're not talking about just daily living, right? That's compared to $890 billion last year. That's a lot of money, and this is all holiday-related spending. And what this shows is that our focus has long ago, as a society at least, has shifted from the one whose birth we're celebrating to ourselves as we spend money uh, on experiences and gifts. As a society, we become civilized, modern, advanced, we're socially adept, and all that progress can sometimes mask the fundamental problem of evil and sin that still rules in the heart of those who have not submitted their lives to King Jesus. And sadly, this Christmas, many of our neighbors will reach to unwrap the gifts on Christmas Day, right? 
and yet miss out on what they need most, a restored relationship with the Creator. Think about that. For the moment, as they maybe will unwrap the brightly colored package, they'll, they'll have a moment of joy or a moment of happiness because their wish came true or maybe they wanted this and somebody thought of them. But only for a moment, for as the days go by, life that is not aligned with God will continue to be battered on by the daily storms of trouble, by the injustices of the reality, by the pain and brokenness of sin, by the noisy gloom of a world that is in need of order. And people turn to politicians, they turn to social systems, philosophical systems, all in an attempt to solve this ever-growing complicated problem that we face as humanity, problem that lives within us, all the while knowing that deep inside we all long to live in a well-ordered world where there's no more corruption, no more uncertainty, and no more divisions and no more oppression. And the irony is that even though as a nation we celebrate Christmas, we somehow managed to exclude the most paramount point of Christmas. Christmas was meant to proclaim the gospel, which simply means the good news. And the good news is that King Jesus was born and that changes everything, literally everything. The joy of Christmas was meant to be the joy of celebration of God's rescue operation for the world. That was set in life or set in motion through the life, the birth, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the joy. That's the good news. That's the apex of Christmas celebration. So you can have the holiday cheer without Jesus. You can. You can enjoy the season and go blow through the whole season all the way to the 24th. Maybe even into the New Year's. But you cannot have the peaceful joy that comes from knowing King Jesus and living in His kingdom. And as we think about approaching Christmas celebration, here are some questions for us to process and ask ourselves. Are we honoring Christ with the way we celebrate Christmas? Are we truly approaching it as the greatest event in the history of the world? Are we countering the erosion of Christmas with a more bold and vivid stand for the gospel, for what it truly is? Is the voice and presence of the church countering the cur countering the cultural and secular narrative of Christmas in our society. And how do we do that? How can we even do that? How can the message of Christ's coming be more visible and real and alive in our lives? And so those are the questions that I hope we will address today as we go back in, in history, go back to the story. And to do that, I'd like to look back with you because looking back is important in order to see ahead. We always have to pray, frame our present in relation to what God has done and what He will continue to do. And so, um, the first book in your New Testament would be Matthew. That's like the second portion of the Bible would be New Testament. And the first book would be Matthew. Now, that's where probably my focus is going to be there uh, for, for today. And now, before we, we talk about it, I'd like to talk about the author who wrote this book, Matthew himself. And you might know that he was a disciple of Jesus, which means he spent time with Jesus, soaking in all the events that transpired in Jesus' ministry. You might also know that he was a tax collector, and because of that, he was despised by his own, for obvious reasons. But that also means that he was well qualified to write an account of Jesus' life. Because he needed to be literate in Greek, he needed to be well organized. Uh, another thing about Matthew is he was well um, aware of the current kingdom, the, the, Rome, the Rome's empire, right? Like he was aware what a kingdom is like and was well acquainted with them because he worked for them. He understood that system well. And so what we see is that about after 30 or 40 years after Christ ascended, people were still retelling the story of Jesus like this, standing in front of other people and sharing the story. But there came a time, 34 years later, where Matthew was possibly one of the first uh, disciples to write down the account of Jesus' life. Now, what I find striking is that the way Matthew laid out this account of Jesus' life, like it's hard to read through the gospel and not notice that Matthew is painting for us a picture which every Jew at that time would clearly recognize. And so today, we, the, one of the last scriptures that were read, were read from Matthew. Now, majority of the first chapter of Matthew might be something that you and I would want to just dismiss and kind of skip over it. I mean, it's great to know the lineage of Jesus, like where he, you know, who were his, 
ancestors, but like, what's so special about it, right? And so it begins with the book of genealogy or the record of uh, Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of David, the son of David, son of Abraham. And then it goes through the list of all these biblical characters. And then it arrives at, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. That word Christ is the Messiah. That's a big word right there. So all generations from Abraham to David, 14 generations. Uh, from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14. From Babylon to Christ, the Messiah, the Jesus, 14. So what? We read through the whole list. What, what's the point? It's a list of Israel's historical characters. What's so special about this? And yet, if you were Jewish living in the first century, your attention would be immediately caught by the genealogy. For it claims something that would send your heart racing. Like it's a big deal. And you would suddenly become overwhelmed. Hold on. Could this possibly be? And, and you want to know more. And you would continue reading through the story, chapter after chapter. That's the way Matthew wrote the book. And although the account of Jesus' life, as this Jewish person would be reading it, depending on whether they heard about him by this point or not, might have been new, yet in every word and turn of the phrase, you as a reader would hear something sacred, something that is so dear to your heart. You would see the unfolding of your expectations that you lived with your whole life. And it turns out that these expectations were fulfilled in someone who walked on earth not too long ago. And your heart would be burning within you with all the connections that are coming together. Because what Matthew is saying is that Jesus has a royal lineage. No, he's saying more than that. His book is, is carefully and thoroughly presenting the point that Jesus is the king, the anticipated king. The Messiah. That's the big word. Like, it has a tremendous weight behind it, what Matthew is claiming here when he's writing this. Now, the special part uh, is that David calls him the son of David. Like, as if that's of big importance. And he's not the only one. I mean, here's Luke writing down the words of angels. He will be great and will be called son of the most high. And the Lord will give to him the throne of his father David. Or to pull another one in, here's Paul in Romans 1. Look how he begins his letter. I mean, these are different guys writing from different perspectives. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in, his holy, in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh. You might say, well, that's, that's great. But what does the fact that he's the son of David has to offer in the New Testament? I mean, we know the story. It's all about Jesus' life. He lived, or he, came, he was born, he lived his life, left behind a set of teachings, uh, suffered the substitutionary death on the cross, right? Uh, for our sins. Then he was raised. And because of his death and resurrection, we have means of entering into God's presence. That's the story of Jesus. And yes, that's all true. But if you were to ask Matthew what the gospel is, what is the good news? What's this big, great news? He would say, see all the prophets I'm quoting? You see all the references in the Bible to Messiah? And how like a puzzle, it all fits together in the life of Jesus from Nazareth. It all comes together. Like this is like the culmination of that story. The anticipated, long-awaited, anointed king Lord and ruler of Israel and the world is here. Like the whole history of the world, we've been waiting for this. And this moment is finally here. That's what Matthew is presenting in his book. What else does the genealogy tell us? Well, if we look, look, uh, if we look, look, if we look, look at Luke and Matthew, they both present the genealogy. And with the minor differences that one Talk, or not minor, but one talks about probably the parental line and one about the maternal line uh, leading up to Jesus. But there was, it's more than just listing the list. It's making a statement. As a Jewish person, as you read each name, the history of Israel's God's people would rise before your eyes. From Abraham to Isaac to Jacob, all the way to David, right? These are, this is our history. 
And he's invoking that image for them. And all of it in perfect configuration, culminating in the birth of Jesus as the Messiah. Now, Jesus did not begin a new way of doing things. It was him leading the Israel all along, if you will. And up to this point, and now it culminates in his arrival on earth as the Messiah. And I guess so for, for us, the 21st century readers, what Matthew would say is that you won't understand the story of Jesus unless you see it in light of the long story of Old Testament. You won't understand it. There's this enormous tension in the Old Testament that without the New Testament, it's like reading your favorite page turner novel and then right before the resolution comes, you just sort of put it away. Eh. Not, not a big deal, right? Like that's the kind of tension that the Old Testament is building up to the New Testament. It, maybe it's like watching the final season of a show or just the final season of a show without watching anything that led many years before that. Um, because the emphasis that Jesus is the king was the, at the foundation of the Old Testament and of the gospel in the first century. Whether it was preached to Jews or Gentiles, think about it. When it was preached, it was not just preached that Jesus saves you from your sins. It was preached that Jesus is the now ruling king of the world. And if you submit to him, your life will be completely transformed. And of course, as you might imagine, uh, there are certain implications for every believer if Jesus is the king, but we'll talk more on that later. But that's why we preach the whole Bible. Because Jesus is not just a wise teacher who made up a new system of religion. Neither he nor anyone in the first century would ever claim, claim that. The Bible presents us with one continuous story from creation to consummation. Consummation meaning the time when this present age will finally uh, cease to exist and a new heaven and a new earth will be ushered in. And so, if we were to continue to read Matthew, we, we could not escape from the theme of the kingdom. Following the chapter of Jesus' birth, which has a ton of prophecies lined up, to show that this is like, it's impossible. I think uh, at some point, Pastor Russell mentioned that um, if you take the probability of even one prophecy of that happening, it had to do something with throwing a bunch of coins uh, over the state of Texas, uh, with a foot, one foot height or something like that. And then... Uh, taking one coin, marking it, dropping it from an airplane while passing over the state of Texas, then tying the person with a blindfold and sending them to go and walk through all the coins and then reach in and pick just the exact marked coin that you dropped. That is the probability of just one of the prophecies happening in the life of Jesus. And there's like hundreds of them. And so, for um, if, if we were to look at the Matthew, the way he's... he's uh, presenting Jesus here, we would see that right after the birth of Jesus, he would um, explain to us that there's the announcement of king, the, uh, God's kingdom coming to reign. He, we would see that uh, God is creating this new family of those who will follow him and obey his teaching and live under his rule. Uh, that this kingdom will be a different kind of kingdom, almost like an upside down kind of kingdom because everything is different in it. There's no privilege in this kingdom. The poor, the nobodies, the rich, or the wealthy, they're all welcome into this kingdom. And Matthew would show how Jesus then brings that kingdom about by showing the examples of how he, the Messiah, began healing and restoring the lives of the broken and hurting people already in that time. And that would be, of course, part of the promises that the Old Testament say what would happen when Messiah would one day come. Then we would see the parables of the kingdom. Again, it's all about the king. Are you seeing this? And it's not just Matthew. Following this would be the stunning idea that Jesus would be the suffering servant. Again, a different kind of ascension to become a king. Finally, Matthew would conclude after the resurrection that to Jesus is given all power and authority. He is the ruling king. And that he is the king of heaven and earth. And all of this would be deeply recognizable to Jewish people at the time. Because of years and centuries of spiritual, social, political tension that created an enormous atmosphere of anticipation for that one king that we are all waiting for. And I'm sure we can all relate to waiting, um, anticipating a longing for something that we care about. In the beginning of October, we placed an offer for a house that we liked. Beginning of October, right? Very first days. And 
This past Friday, we're what, in December now. This past Friday was the last day, finally, when we moved in. That's a long time. Now, we had an arrangement where uh, throughout the November, the family that was still living there would take up to the whole of November to move out. Now, we were blessed that they moved out earlier. But it was kind of this weird thing. We've bought the place, about to pay for it as well, right? And... Uh, it's like, it's ours, but we're not there yet. And you sit at home and you know that maybe in a few weeks you'll get to move in there. I mean, you, you can probably all relate, right? This is normal with moving in. That's one kind of waiting. Um, but when you're waiting for something great, there's, there's a kind of joy when it finally happens. Um, like waiting for a vacation. You've scheduled it, it's coming, it's going to be great. And when it finally happens, you're enjoying it. You're full of joy. Or maybe waiting for a baby to be born. Right? Or maybe when you were little and waited for parents to return from a long trip. That's a kind of waiting. Or waiting to graduate from school. Or waiting for retirement for some of us. Now, imagine your whole lifetime and waiting, right? Anticipating, waiting for the king. And then the parents before you waited their whole lifetime. And the generations before you all waited, not doubting the promises of God. That one day the Messiah will come and he will sit on the throne of David and he will rule over the whole world. As a result, life will never be the same and we will continue to wait because it will bring about a global change. And that's what Israel essentially lived with every day. Now I thought, can we look back and trace this idea of anticipated king? Like, what would it mean for people back then and to the people nowadays that Jesus is the long-awaited king? Like, where is that anticipation coming from? Where, where did the waiting begin? Well, this tension was set in motion long ago. It's as old as the world itself. The first man, Adam, was actually the first king, if you think about it. The king that was supposed to rule over the whole world. You look at the language in Genesis 1, God gave him a domain. That's a kingdom language. And so Adam is put in charge of a kingdom. He was taking care of the garden, taking care of agriculture, you know, naming all the animals. He was accomplishing the mission that God set him or appointed him to do. And it's worth noting that until his downfall, he was a successful king, ruling over all that was given to him. And then comes a time when what happens? He fails to rule and reign over himself and his household. He eats the forbidden fruit and the kingdom crumbles. And I think that there and then, the anguish of, of a failed mission set the foundation for the waiting for the king that would come and do it right and would not fail and would do it forever. One, here, one thing to note here is that Adam likely did not fail overnight, right? I mean, he spent a considerable amount of time in the garden, building his kingdom, naming the animals, right? Taking care of it. But slowly because of neglect and disobedience, sin crept into his heart. And one day it all came tumbling down. And I just thought, you know, all of the time spent carefully building the garden, taking care of it, right? Like putting your... Your, all your strength and, and knowledge into it. Again, God gave him the pristine wisdom. It was the organic environment. And then to be banished from the kingdom, never again to reap the fruits of that garden. Imagine the kind of pain that it created. But it wasn't without hope. For even God says to, to, to Adam there, that even though you succumbed to the ruling of the serpent now, you listen to him, the reign of that serpent will not last. For he will be crushed one day. And so, as I review all this, I think the haunting feeling of the lost paradise is something that is lodged in our DNA ever since Adam and Eve were banished from the garden. Like that feeling that all humanity now in the quiet of their soul can feel this pain and the desire for the future, for the true order to be restored. And I think we can all relate to that, that if not Jesus, there is this big longing inside that only he can um, satisfy. Now, before we judge Adam too harshly, uh, let's take a moment to think upon our own lives. Because God gave us uh, in our lives each a domain to manage. He gave us, 
you know, either ourselves or our business or our skills or resources. How are you doing with what God entrusted you? Right? Like, why are we on the subject of managing kingdom? We each, in a sense, have an area we rule over. Are we building up with God's strength what we've been giving? Or are we tearing it down because of sin, neglect, and disobedience? But with Adam, there's hope. And every descendant from Adam and Eve onwards would wistfully look back to the time when heaven was so close, when God was so close, when they were in the garden, and they would long for that restored order. Now let's fast forward a few thousand years to Abraham. This is where Matthew begins, and this is when God set out to do something new and amazing. Now, of course, he calls Abraham not because of anything that Abraham did. Um, Abraham responds. God calls him righteous and then gives him a promise. And in that promise, he says that all the nations will be blessed in you, Abraham. All the nations will be blessed in him. Which in itself is a very odd idea because Israel was a very exclusive society. Like they were very to themselves. And yet if we go all the way back, we see that in that promise that God gave to Abraham already was this idea that one day the many nations will be together under God. And that in him, in Abraham, they will be blessed. And the fulfillment of this promise, that's what partially what Matthew is saying when he's bringing up Abraham, is that the fulfillment of the promise began that night in Bethlehem when Jesus was born. All of this is part of the Christmas story. Now a careful reader of the Bible would notice that when God made the promise to Abraham, he also mentioned the royal future. If we look at Genesis 17, 6. Are you guys seeing these? Genesis 17, 6. Can, can I have a Genesis 17, 6? There you go. If we look at Genesis 17, 6, it says, this is the promise God gave to Abraham. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. Think of it. God who sees the whole history as a timeline before him is placing a promise for what is for sure going to happen. These were not predictions. These are promises. A prediction is something you throw. Maybe it will happen, maybe not. A promise has a person standing behind it. And in this case, it is the person of God himself. Well, if we were to then fast forward to Jacob, one of the grandchildren of Abraham, we'll see a similar picture uh, hinting at the royal line of the future king. So Jacob is one of the grandchildren of Abraham. He calls 12 sons and he's about to bless them. And notice that the blessing that he gives to Judah, one of his sons. Now, Jesus, of course, being from the tribe of Judah, as Matthew would note it. So here's Genesis 49.10, which was read also today. The scepter, which is a symbol of ruling, will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he to whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of the nations shall be his. Like, are you seeing this? Back in Genesis, the pressure is building up. There is this one coming to whom it belongs. Way before Jesus would come and see. And all the nations shall be his. Who else could it be but Jesus? And as the time goes on, there is this theme of kingdom unfolding throughout the whole of the Old Testament. And this longing for a new king would reach its peak, for the, at least for Israel. Especially during the times when they would be enslaved. I mean, think of Israelites in Egypt, right? Under the oppression, under the heavy weight of uh, Pharaoh's rule. Longing for a king. Longing finally for someone who's going to rule justly. Who's going to do it right. And that's all built in into the history of waiting for that king. And of course, in there they, they see a glimpse of it. They see the liberator Moses. Who leads them to Exodus. Meaning they escape from Egypt into the promised land into which God leads them. And God frees them from that dominion, from that kingdom. Now Moses himself, he's pointing ahead of, to a time, he says, when Israel would have a king. And he describes specifically what a godly king should look like, be like, act like. Again, if you're a careful reader of the Bible, you might protest and say, hold on. Didn't God say that they were wrong to ask for a king? Remember when they asked uh, for, for, for Saul. They were wrong in that, that they asked for a king, quote, such as the other nations have. As you might imagine, the nations around didn't really have 
God-honoring kings. And so it happened that as they asked for a king, the kind that they wanted, they received Saul. All the while, God intended for David to be the one. And sometimes God, on the way to grace, takes his people through this panoramic scenery of sinful or devastation of sin. In many ways, giving people exactly what they asked for. And that's what happened with Saul. They asked for a king like the other nations had. Now, if we move on to David, David, with all his shortcomings, um, what he did have is the kind of heart that God was looking for. David uh, had a deep and faithful relationship with God, and that makes all the difference. It's not that he didn't sin, it's just that God was his refuge, his hope, his everything. He had a living relationship with God. Now, during David's reign, wonderful things began to happen. There was this sense of restoration, because David brought the ark back, the ark of, of the covenant. He gathered the materials for the temple. His son would then build this temple. And so... David and his son Solomon are associated with this period of restoration, age of prosperity, and great renown among all of the ancient Near East. Sometimes I think, and you, you could probably relate to this, I think we get glimpses of heaven in the lives of the people around us. And I think it's because we're all immortal souls and many of us are already in the kingdom of God. And so when that kingdom comes and shines through the life of other people, we see glimpses of heaven. I think something similar happened um, every time with each king, with each prophet, with each priest. Israel saw glimpses of the future king. And so it was probably with David. And when you see that, that, one long, that makes one long for that true king to come even more. But as I looked at it, you know, time went on. Kings lived out their lives. They all still looked toward the day when the true king would rule. And as the 80 years of golden age passed, the human nature that hasn't been submitted, submitted fully to the reign of God would constantly be detrimental to this. And the sin would continue to eat away at any sense of progress. And yet... Everyone in Israel waited. They waited for the arrival of the king who would rule forever and never fail. And I found myself asking, but why? Like what, what would be so special about the reign of Messiah? How would they change things? How would the kingdom, how different would it be? And what difference would it make? And I think we can see a glimpse of that vision for what they were looking forward to. We could see it Psalm 72, which was written by Solomon the king. And he was looking ahead to a greater David, a future king. Now, we're not going to read through the whole psalm, but although I considered it for a moment, but I am going to show it to you on the screen, at least the portions that I'm going to be talking about. There's these like four um, parts that we can look at, the four outstanding dimensions that identify the coming kingdom and its king. So Psalm 72, verses 1 through 4. If you look at the, what the message is in this first part, it's this first dimension of the future king is going to be righteousness. Like this first virtue of government, even before compassion, righteousness. Because if the government is not righteous, its compassion will always have a catch. By righteous, we mean truly right, like pure, right with God. Today, as it was so many years and centuries ago, sin spoils the best of leaders. Like no matter what their good intentions are, we put our trust in this next leader. He rises up to power. And if you give too much power to a leader, they just, they just corrupt over time. If their heart is not given over to Jesus. And the Old Testament said that the new king will rule with righteousness. He will be utterly pure and righteous. No more corruption. And that's not much different from what the world longs for today, right? We want political and social leaders who have integrity. We long for that. So who could be this king that will always do right? David demonstrated great obedience in life, but yet he wasn't fully obedient. And so Israel awaited for the one that would finally be truly righteous because he would be perfect in all of his ways. And so the hope... Of the world for Matthew, for every Jewish person, rests in, this, in the coming of this righteous and obedient king. Now as we move on to the next uh, part, 
uh, verses 5 through 7, it talks about that righteous king is already great and amazing. But imagine that this king would rule forever. It will last beyond comprehension until the moon is no more. A kingdom with no end. That's what the Messiah would come to bring. Now think about it. When Matthew is writing it, that's what sort of he's looking back. No more re-elections. No more impending uncertainty of what will happen when the king passes away. This will last forever. And that's why the anticipated king would change everything. The world as we know it. It will be marked by stability and assurance. Now moving on to the next verses 8 through 11. It only gets better. This kingdom that will be righteous and eternal. It will also be universal. This king would rule over all creation as God intended in the beginning. A king that would unite people regardless of their race, nationality, citizenship, culture, language, gender, social status, even across time. He would unite them all. Imagine in the first century when Jesus was born, a shepherd that's approaching the manger to see the baby that will be the Messiah, the promised king who in short, will come, in short time will come to rule over all. That's the kind of imagery they had when they heard that the Messiah is born in Bethlehem. Moving on to the uh, fourth portion of the psalm, verses 12 to 14. Finally, we see that in this last part here, that this kingdom would be unlike other rulers of this world. He would not take from his people. He would only give. There will be no more oppression. Now, of course, the readers or the hearers would think that Jesus the Messiah would then take off the yoke of the Roman Empire. Uh, but he would do a much greater thing. As he would bring the deliverance and freedom and true care for the souls. That's what Messiah did. He would be a compassionate king. So just in this one psalm, we have a picture of this coming king. And we see that he will be righteous, eternal, universal, compassionate. Now Matthew, as he would write this, he would have a larger picture of Jewish scripture. Like in his mind, right? With every step as he describes, describes what he saw in Jesus as he walked on earth, he himself is amazed how perfectly the life of Jesus embodies what the prophets promised. What was promised and prophesied in the Old Testament. Now here's one last example that was also read today from the Old Testament uh, that I will share with you. But there are hundreds more. Uh, this one is going to be from, chapter, uh, from Isaiah chapter 9. Where it says, For unto us a child is born, a son is given, and government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And then it says, Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. So outside of all the descriptive features pointing to the birth of Jesus, notice that the Messiah will be ruling on the throne of David. Like this is the picture that Jewish people had in their mind when they thought of the Messiah. But... That's why for the writers of the New Testament, when they saw, they saw in Jesus not just a personal Savior. This is an important point. Because that He is. He is a personal Savior. But in Jesus, they saw the Messiah as the coming of the long-awaited King. The one whose rule began during His ministry, but has not reached its completion yet until we wait for consummation, right? With this King would come the Kingdom. And the disciples were the first ones to join this Kingdom. And this is what Matthew is trying to bring across through the list of genealogy as he goes on to structure the gospel in such a way to show that Jesus is the king that we have waited for. Now David's life miraculously parallels the, the life of, of Jesus. Like if you look at it, there's a lot of parallels. David was um, the youngest in the family when he became a king. Jesus was from the smallest of the tribes, from the tribe of Judah. And Micah prophesies and says, even though you're from the smallest of the tribes, from you will come the ruler whose origins from old, from ancient times. Again, hinting at Jesus. Both David and Jesus suffered on the way to exaltation. Both David and Jesus were in exile. Both were anointed. Um, there's a lot of parallels in there as well. And God constructed it in such a way as to point to the future coming king. And a lot of it has been um, in David's life. And then, of course, there's the Mount Moriah. The great moment where... 
You remember when Abraham was asked to bring Isaac as a sacrifice? It was on Mount Moriah. Later, David would meet God on Mount Moriah as well and bring sacrifices. Solomon would build the first temple on Mount Moriah. And later, Jesus himself would bring himself as a sacrifice for the whole world on the same exact place or around the Mount Moriah. And so, when we look at all of this, what does the fact that Jesus is king change for us, right, as his people? Um, a lot of people look at salvation as simply just this legal transaction that took place. It's just an acquittal from the consequence of sin. But that's just part of, that's just the plan of salvation. The gospel is so much bigger than that. When we share the good news with people, it can often become human-centered as a solution to a problem. But what the gospel of the first century is that we see in the Bible is that it's an announcement of a coming king. And to join him or to come under him is to come with absolute surrender under King Jesus. That's the only way that your life could change and, and, and you would live out in the restored and a new way that God intended for the creation to be. Now, Americans don't really like kings. I mean, it's just not our thing if you think about it. We did have once a king, and it didn't go really well. And so now we live in democracy. That's not a bad thing in itself. Um, the Bible doesn't tell us to have a specific kind of government. But what could happen is when the, gov the structure or the government that we live in starts to influence our thinking, you know, with our faith. When we start to mingle the two together. Because coming under a king is so much different than the way the government is done here. We cannot negotiate with the king. When we come to him, uh, we surrender to him. That's not how God's kingdom works. It's not a democracy. It's not about figuring out what works for me and what works for God. It's coming under authority of a sovereign king. It's an absolute surrender. Jesus taught us to deny ourselves, take up the cross, and make serving Jesus our highest priority. And so... This might sound strange, submitting to king when we live in a democracy. But if you consider it, there's only two. There's only the domain of darkness or the kingdom of God, as Paul would say to Colossians. He took us, rescued us, redeemed us from the domain of darkness, and placed us in the kingdom of his son. There's really no other choice. There's no neutral ground. And so when we submit to him, we submit to the creator, the one who rules over all creation and over all the world. And so... Here's a great way that Gail Irvin paints what living under King Jesus is like. And I'll be coming to a close here. He says, what might such a government look like? Well, first of all, it would look like it's king. Politicians of this day look for what they can get from you. Jesus looks what he can do for you. Leaders of this day surround themselves with servants. Jesus surrounds us with his servanthood. Leaders of this day use their power to build their empire. Jesus uses his power to wash our feet and make us clean and comfortable. Leaders of this day trade their influence for money. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Generals of this day need regular wars to keep their weapons and skills up to date and ensure their own advancement. Jesus bring peace and rest to our hearts. The higher the plane of importance that one reaches in this world, the more inaccessible he becomes. Jesus was Emmanuel, God with us. And leaders of this day are desperate to be seen and heard. Jesus sought anonymity so that he could be useful. And so he says, whenever I see people give up their lucrative careers simply to go and share the good news of Jesus, I know they are governed by God. When I see loving Christians gently caring for orphans and those rejected by family, I know I am watching people governed by God. When I see people leave family and leave family to live and teach in distant lands because they love the people who have not heard, I know they are governed by God. And so, as I'm bringing to the close, you know, becoming a citizen of a particular country grants you status. It grants you responsibility, privileges, rights. It is the same with the kingdom of God. We now are the representatives. We are the ambassadors of the kingdom, if you will. We are the ones through whom the heaven comes down on earth. We are commissioned by a king 
to invite all the other nations to come and join in this kingdom. We are the royal family who are called to live in the power and holiness of our king. This is the backstory for Christmas message that Matthew presents when he begins with the genealogy. To celebrate Christmas is to celebrate the arrival of the king. With all the implications of living under Jesus' sovereign rule. This kingdom will be visible by the way we live, we pray, we make decisions in our life, and share the good news with others. The good news is that Jesus is the culmination of Israel's history. And that the new age has begun, an age under the rule of the anticipated king, King Jesus, who came to rule over those who would follow him. Those who were once falling apart, being undone by sin, but redeemed by Christ as new life in the kingdom begins. That is what the philosophy and religion of this world is trying to accomplish. They're trying to uh, fix that, but with no avail. Because the soul remains where it is. And it's all because it needs a king. A ruler who is more powerful, righteous, just, eternal, universal. Somebody who is above all ailments. Somebody who can protect and give and nourish. And that is our king, Jesus. And that's a remarkable difference between Christianity against the backdrop of religion. Is that we gather around a person, not just a teaching. The person of King Jesus. The one who we follow and we strive to live out and practice with him by our side, in our hearts. So let's stand up and worship our King. Father, we are blessed to know you, Lord. We are blessed that 2,000 years ago there, the promises that you have made in the Old Testament have come true. That all of it, Lord, culminated in you coming and establishing and inaugurating the kingdom in which we, 2,000 years later, we're also invited to be a part of, Lord. We're blessed to know you as our King. And today, Father, as a church, as we spend this time looking back and seeing, as you anticipated King, King are here with us now, bless us, Father, to live as your royal family, as those who live in the kingdom of God. We pray, Father, that those who come through the doors of Woodmark would see that here people live under sovereign authority of the King and Lord Jesus Christ. Now we're also going to have communion today, so uh, communion is a time for us when we remember that time when King Jesus came to die for us so that we could all enter into the kingdom. We remember him, um, the blood that he shed and the body that was broken for us. And so we're going to have brothers come up front and they're going to be standing on, on both sides and there's going to be wine and juice option. You can take whichever one you prefer. Uh, during worship right now, go ahead and come forward and then uh, take the elements and take, uh, go back to your seats and then we'll pray and take them together.
for the elements right now. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you have come down to this earth to become the king of this new kingdom, Lord. And today we are taking the time to remember the cost, remember the price has been paid so that we could be part of this kingdom, Lord. And today as we take of this, we are blessed to know that in this kingdom, Lord, you invite everybody. That by partaking in your blood, Lord, and in, in, the, in your body, Today, Lord, we can be reminded that we're part of this great kingdom, Lord, and that we can go out and be your body and your feet in the world around us, Lord. And so we thank you, Father, for what you have done on the cross, for the healing, for the restoration, for the change that you brought about in our life, for the new life that we receive in your blood and in your body. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's partake together.
we dismiss you. Um, Daniel and Tanya, why don't you come back up here? Daniel, you gave birth to a girl, and you know, girls sometimes they have their own tastes and desires and schedules, and she just didn't feel like she wanted to be next to some of the other kids, so she decided to be on her own schedule. That's okay. It's a, it's a gift from the Lord, girls are. And uh, we want to dedicate uh, sweet Eleanor today to the Lord. Vlad, why don't you come up here as well? Stretch our hands towards baby Eleanor. Jesus. Today, today we dedicate this sweet baby Eleanor to you and to your kingdom. To your kingdom. You are king. And this baby belongs to your kingdom. Today we dedicate this child to your kingdom, to your reign, to your influence, to your grace, to your presence. May your name be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Your protection over her, over her mind, over her body. Jesus, may she grow up to make an impact in your kingdom. May she grow up to be uh, an honorable citizen of your kingdom. Someone that loves you. Bless Daniel and Tanya. Bless this home with your sweet presence. Father, reign over their home. Protect this home. In Jesus mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for being with us. We got a little gift for baby Eleanor as well. The Lord bless you all. Have a great week. Have a great time. Enjoy some time with family. These are times with families. The Lord be with you. Thank you for being with us today.